Rupa, thanks very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. You were a co-author on the report Dreaming with Bricks, and I, the first question I wanted to ask you is whether or not you feel that that report has stood the test of time. I do. It's been seven years, actually, since we first published it. It was in late 2003. And, you know, for India in particular, um, the growth rates that we talked about kind of trend over the long run was 6.5%. So I think, if anything, um, what we've seen since then is that a lot of people think that that's probably too conservative. Um, for China, it's still sort of yet to be seen because we had sort of high trend rates, but they fall off pretty dramatically once you get to about 2017, 2018 again because of China's demographics. Brazil and Russia are a little bit more, so I would say for China and India, more than anything, even as we've seen the global sort of downturn happen, they've kind of taken up more market share, um, particularly when you look at things like global demand. And that was the inspiration for the, the piece in the first place. It, was no, it wasn't to say these are four economies, look at how they're going to grow. It was to say that as global sort of investors, when you think about market demand, um, global demand is going to shift toward these economies. Brazil and Russia, I think the projections for trend growth were relatively um, uh, um, conservative. And so I think, again, they're about 3.5% over the long run. And I think we're going to see that. They're just going to be a little bit more because they're the other two, China and India, are more commodity um, takers and the other are commodity producers. So you're going to see them, particularly now, kind of go through sort of different um, ups and downs at different times. So they're an interesting sort of basket together. But I think the story, if anything, um, the numbers have come out when you look between then and now more aggressive than we projected. Um, but you're going to just see a lot of, for trend growth over such long periods, I think it's obviously we know that each year we're not going to hit it. And I think we're going to see a lot of submerging and, and some sometimes some years where they overshoot. But I think it's pretty much intact. We wouldn't change anything and we hadn't. Right. Well, if you were to, if you were to write a new report today, are there any other markets you'd squeeze into that acronym? I think there's been lots of different variations of that acronym thrown around. Um, I don't think so. I mean, the point of that was really to be representative. And, you know, the, the idea of taking those four markets were really that they were the four largest developing countries. And we really wanted to say if we take big population economies that are growing relatively fast, it's not rocket science, but they're going to be able to change the face of global demand over the long run. There's a whole set, not really, you can't really just go down to largest GDP, but if you look at economies that have um, relatively fast growth, but big populations as well. There's a nexus of sort of another group. Um, and Goldman Sachs has actually done a whole piece on um, the next 11. So there are a whole set of other countries that are both large population. And we sort of see, you know, things changing in terms of the reform processes, demographics, and so on that really kind of push them to be, again, big changers in terms of their weights in global demand over the next few decades. Okay. Well, moving on to uh, a more recent project, you wrote a report, The Next Urban Frontier, 20 Cities to Watch in India. Uh, can you tell us uh, sort of the top trends you, you noted in that report? Sure. You know, I think just as a little bit of background, um, in the role that I play now, I had research for, um, for Everstone Investment Advisors. And the research is still very long term, and it really focuses on demographics, um, but trying to look beyond the headline demographic numbers and really trying to see over the long run what structural changes are going to define the economy. So um, urbanization is one um, that we think is going to be a big theme that everyone has talked about a lot, but actually in India, urbanization has played out in a very different way to what we've seen in China. Um, you've actually seen urbanization peak in the 1970s, the pace of urbanization, and it's actually since then fallen off. Um, in India. In India. So in between 2005 and 2010, we think we're going to start to see that inflection point sort of change, and we're going to see an, an increase again. Um, but what we wanted to say with this uh, most recent paper was that it's really the next sort of coming trend that when it happens to India, it's really going to affect global urbanization patterns. We think about, on very conservative estimates, about 380 million people are going to be added to India's urban spaces over the next few decades. So that's more than the entire population of the U.S. sort of moving into uh, into urban India. So that's going to be one of the most defining changes that we have yet to see. Um, and even when you look now at what's happened, any growth that we have gotten um, in urban spaces has largely been due to natural increase. So people within cities having kids. We haven't seen migration take off, um, either in the way that it has been hyped up in the press or in the media, or um, when you just look at social issues and what's taking place. I think there's a lot of hype around it, but we haven't seen it on the ground take place to the degree. 
um, that you see it talked about in the papers, and it hasn't taken place to the degree that we've seen in other uh, parts of the region. So we have yet to see that happen, but that's going to be a, a huge change. When we did this paper, we um, partnered with the National Council of Applied Economic Research because we really wanted to say, you know, no one understands, first of all, everyone thinks this process is just happening to the country, and for policy, um, either we're just going to let it happen to us, or we're going to try to stop it. That's almost been the, uh, up till now, up till recently, that's almost been the kind of attitude towards it. And we wanted to say, look, this is a process that is going to happen, um, could be hugely beneficial to the economy in terms of providing an outlet for semi-skilled labor um, to be able to find pockets of employment, but we need to understand how the process is actually occurring on the ground. So we tried to take the survey that NCAAR does, which basically looks at income expenditure patterns across India. Um, and, and try to look at the top 20 cities to see how these things evolve. And you really get quite interesting patterns. You know, for India, anytime you talk about averages, um, it's really masking these huge swings. So averages mean very little. Um, so when you look at anything uh, from uh, the percentage that households spend uh, of their income just on, on average uh, spending, it goes from, you know, houses in Mumbai and Ahmedabad spending about half of their income um, every year, all the way up to if you go to a Bhopal and a Jalandhar, they spend 75% of their income. So you get very big changes, which has implications, not necessarily income that matters, but it's almost um, you know different sort of uh, uh, spending behaviors as you go across geographies that really determine um, what's happening. So there might be these smaller cities, um, might not be as big as the five million plus cities, might be a million or, or, or just under, um, and they don't have income levels that are as high as the biggest cities, but they just spend a lot more. So what you're seeing is that in some small towns, consumer spending patterns are actually evolving more quickly. So there are some deeper markets for certain areas, um, you know, you like account, luxury. How do you account for that? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with, it. you know, India is not by any means a homogeneous market. It's a bunch of heterogeneous markets that have a lot to do with um, cultural patterns um, with regards to spending. So it's not just as your income rises, you instantly see evolution towards certain things. Is there an explosion of credit, for example, that's happening? Again, it, you know what you've seen for credit is that um, there's probably a lot more penetration than people um expect in tier two cities. So the cities I was just talking about were tier three. Tier two, which again are big demographics, probably just under between one million and five million. Um, and uh, and they're kind of the next big pocket for sectors that are kind of geared towards demographics. So food, apparel, financial services. So these guys actually are pretty, um, some of them, it's very idiosyncratic, but you'll get some tier, tier two cities that are very well penetrated. Some tier one cities, so these five million plus cities that we always talk about, um, that actually aren't, that there's still a lot of legs to go for the financial sort of penetration story to play out, particularly with respect to credit. So you get some of these, when you look at the highest penetration, there'll be these tier two cities that are the highest. So again, it's very, it, you can't really go by large swaths to, to pick out where you're, you know, what city you're going to, to penetrate. You really need to look individually because there are a lot of idiosyncratic patterns. What, what would you say are the, are, the, are the biggest changes you've seen in consumer behavior? You know, I think, um, again, when you go back to the demographics that are driving things, you know, basically what we see for India before I get to the demographics is that we're at, when you look at India relative to the rest of the BRICS, we're at about um, you know, just over $1,000 per head. So we're less than half of the next highest brick, which is China. So what our consumer spending profiles look very different, even if we're in the same bracket of the bricks. We're at this point where we're just entering sort of this sweet spot when you get to about $1,500 per head um, to $3,000 per head, where you get um, a for an increase in income, you start to get a rapid sort of increase in absorption of basic consumer durables. So we're still getting to that point where you start to see from televisions, um, you know, cars and so on, that big sort of S-shaped curve. We're just at the beginning of it. So you have that happening across the economy, I think. But um, there are also things that are structurally changing that once they happen, they don't, you know, you can't reverse them. Um, and one big thing is women are going to work. And I think as that happens, we've started to see um, between 2000 and 2005, um, when you cut employment patterns by geography, by age, you don't see any changes. The only big change you see is that there's been a rise in, in the participation rate of women. And that's big because when you go as far back in the data, back to the 1980s as we have it, participation rates have been low and they've been falling. So this is the first time that we see a rise, and it's a pretty significant rise. And that has really influenced, um, at least in urban India, um, because that's largely where we see the wage and, and salary employment take place, um, that's kind of 
um, sparked a big shift in terms of how people consume. So you see where households where women have started going to work, a big increase in financial services, any spending on children, whether it's clothes, toys, education, that's a huge rise, um, personal care, uh, and, and things like transportation. So I think there are certain trends that are happening that, again, are pretty long-term, and that has held the country pretty well throughout the, the last sort of downturn that we've seen. And are savings down, would you say now? No, savings actually have risen. Yeah, household savings have risen. So again, I think we have a lot of, we have a lot of um, sort of propellers, I think, for, uh, for the economy to go forward, particularly with respect to, again, when you look at demographics, our savings rates are just, they're, rise, they're poised to rise, and, and they will rise for quite a while going forward. And we're seeing that happen in the data, which hopefully will, uh, will help our investment rates as well. Uh, in light of all the, the potential urban growth, how do you see uh, rural India faring? So, you know, we've, it, it's been an interesting balance of the economy throughout the last two years. You know, when, um, you know, when the fall of 2008 hit, um, middle income sort of consumption tanked. Tanked is, uh, you know, that's pretty dramatic because for India, at, at our lowest, our trough for GDP growth was 5.8%. So the markets took a huge hit, but in terms of real activity, um, we still stayed pretty strong. But you did see a dip in, in middle, um, middle income sort of consumption. But at that time, actually, because beforehand we had a relatively um, good monsoon, rural spending um, stayed pretty healthy, not even just healthy, it was pretty robust. So when you look at fast-moving consumer goods, for example, you saw um, rises in consumption for these kinds of goods um, much higher than people expected, even taking into account or adjusting for the downturn. So, um, so the rural sort of spending story stayed very healthy. And then by the time uh, 2009 rolled around, you sort of saw um, the manufacturing sector revived. We saw GDP sort of get its, its footing back. Um, you saw middle income consumption actually recover. So there was about two quarters where we saw a dip and then, and then we, we saw it kind of revive. By that point, the monsoons started to play into people's psychology. So spending in, in rural India kind of was reined back a little bit. So we've had sort of this, you know, for want of a better word, sort of a balancing where kind of the rural consumer really took up the gauntlet in 2008, early 2009, and then this year, what we see going into um, uh, into the coming year, it's really the return of the urban consumer. Well, looking looking ahead five or ten years, what would the composite of the urban consumer look like? Again, I think you know, for India, it's so difficult because it's you know to basically cut it across. Yeah, it it it, it depends where you are and what city you're talking about. Um, you know, I think for when you looked at um, overall kind of uh, um, spending, we saw mid we saw these top 20 cities really account for um, about $100 million of, um, of consumer spending um, in 2006-2007. Um, and a third of it was devoted to, to food. But again, that masks, if you go to Coimbatore, there was a much lower share spent on food, a much higher share spent on health. Um, I think that share is going to continue to shrink. Um, of food and kind of move towards um, food, uh, to clothing, to um, personal care, to higher value added services. Um, but we're, that, that change is happening very, uh, very differently as you move across geographies. Hmm. And so does the report or, or would you make recommendations to companies in terms of how they can approach the Indian consumer? It sounds like it's a very granular thing to a degree. It's quite a granular thing. Um, you know, and I think that uh, the thing is, is that for India relative to China, the thing is, is that India has a huge amount of demand, right? Close to 60% of our GDP um, is composed of, of demand, consumption, private final consumption expenditure. So um, we have a very different sort of composite of our economy relative to, let's say, a China. So there's a huge amount of demand. The issue is, is that we haven't figured out our supply. Whereas in China, supply is completely figured out and trying to stimulate demand is more the issue. So, you know, everything, I think there's demand for many things, but companies that stay strong have really figured out how they're going to get consistent supply over the long run. Because you see a lot of products that come to market and they're successful for a year or two years and then they disappear. So, uh, you know, I think the real important sort of thing is to, to make sure that the best companies really stay capitalized um, um, and figure out uh, a, a long-term sort of supply strategy, um, and uh, and 
if they can do that, uh, you'll find that there is demand for, for good quality um, products. But I think there's really hard, it's very hard for companies to have stamina in the Indian market just to figure out uh, the logistics and the supply chain. That's the biggest issue. Great. Well, thank you very much for speaking with us today. Thank you.